Good morning and welcome to the Sovereign Metals Limited Investor Presentation. Without us recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And now I'd like to hand over to Sapan Guy, CCO from Sovereign Metals. Good morning. Morning, Zach. Thanks for that. Um, welcome, everyone, to our first uh, Investor Meet Company uh, presentation for Sovereign Metals. My name is Sapan Guy. I am Chief Commercial Officer of Sovereign Metals. We're listed on the ASX under the ticker SVM and on AIM under the ticker SVML. Uh, we listed on AIM in mid-December last year, so we're quite aware that not, uh, not not very many people are aware of the story of the investment case and what Sovereign Metals is all about and, and specifically what our uh, Casio Rutile project in Malawi in, in, in southeastern Africa is all about, um, as well as what our commodity uh, Rutile, uh, what are its end uses, in what uh, form, uh, shapes and forms is it used, etc. So I'm going to take the next 20 minutes or so, just running through a few slides here. These slides are from our corporate presentation, which is available on our website. Um, so the first thing, I guess, is what you can see on this front page is, is Casia. It's a drone shot of our project. Um, it's quite a vast uh, a land mass uh, or land package. Um, the rutile that we're looking to uh, effectively mine is within the top five to 15 meters below that top soil that is that is that uh, that bushland and uh, semi-agricultural land that you're seeing there. Um, a little bit of background to Sovereign Metals. So the company has been uh, listed in Australia for about 10 years or so. Uh, during those uh, the first eight or so of those years, the company was really looking at uh, the exploration and development of graphite projects in Malawi. Uh, during that time, uh, that that exploration uh, phase took us to uh, scoping out and putting a pre-feasibility study together for the Malangundi graphite project, which still uh, it, it belongs in the company. That project in itself was taken to a PFS level. Um, that PFS you can find on our website. Uh, and, and, and Malangundi is quite a nice uh, standalone graphite project. Uh, it can it, it had an MPV of around two hundred million dollars for a sixty million dollar um, capex, so it was quite a nice project. But what really segued us into Rutile is while we were doing the BFS work around Malangundi, we found um, quite high levels of Rutile in the tailings of bulk test sampling we were doing on the graphite. That got us to start asking questions around: Well, how much Rutile do we actually have? Is it uh, commercially viable? Um, and can we put a resource on it? And basically by the end of uh, or mid-December last year, we got to a point where we had a scoping study on what is now the Casia uh, Rutile discovery. So, so, so let's get into first um, what exactly is Rutile. So Rutile is a major source of titanium. Um, I actually have some here. I don't know if, if, if you'd be able to see that, but it's a, it's a very reddish brown, uh, bit of a shiny mineral. That, that, that in fact, is straight from, from Casia. That's about 95% uh, titanium dioxide. Now, what it's used in is uh, predominantly in the pigment industry. So uh, brightness, whiteness, opaqueness of paints, uh, and anything that uses pigments like cosmetics, um, sunscreen, uh, plastics, coatings, uh, even foodstuffs. Uh, that that pigment is uh, more uh, more often than not based on uh, titanium dioxide, which Rutol is a is a form of. Um, that market in itself is around fifteen to eighteen million billion dollar market per annum, depending on which source you want to look at. Um, a third of Rutol ends up in the welding industry uh, as welding flux. It has certain chemical parameters that allow it to. Uh, to, to be used within within the welding industry, so uh, that obviously has um, connotations for uh, global uh, 
about construction, infrastructure, projects, etc. As long as we're building um, objects with metal, <laughs> we'll be needing uh, welding and therefore you'll be needing rutile. Um, and, and I think most people are aware of titanium in its in its metal form, uh, which actually is is not the largest component of rutile these days, but is a growing component as more of that titanium metal is being used in uh, in clean tech uh, solutions. Whether that's the the casing for uh, for the battery of an electric vehicle car, it's the coatings on uh, on on offshore wind turbine towers to to prevent them from corrosion. It's used in the medical industry, aerospace, um, etc. So, so given all these uses of titanium, which is the uh, the end product of rutile, it's uh, it's it's no surprise that it's designated a critical raw material by the US and the EU based on supply risk and economic importance. In fact, uh, this has been highlighted quite recently with the um, w with the war in uh, in in Ukraine, uh, with Russia being one of the largest uh, producers of titanium metal. And in fact, companies like Boeing, Airbus, Rolls-Royce used to um, used to source their titanium from uh, from Russia, uh, given self-imposed sanctions on the on those kind of uh, supply routes. Um, it, 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 it's it's filtering out just how critical titanium is to uh, to global industry. So natural rutile is the purest natural form of titanium. So there's mainly two forms of titanium uh, that we mine. Uh, one is uh, natural rutile, which is what we have, and the other is ilmenite. Um, now, ilmenite is around 50% TiO2, or titanium dioxide, and natural rutile uh, tends to be around 95% plus uh, TiO2. And that differential in the, uh, in the titanium dioxide grade uh, is is reflected in the uh, share price. Uh, sorry, not the share prices. The commodity prices. Um, the so ilmenite trades at around two hundred dollars a ton currently on a contractual basis, and natural rutile you can see there is uh, is around uh, almost seven times that, one thousand three hundred fifty dollars a ton. When it comes to supply, about eight million tons overall of uh, TiO two is supplied into. Uh, into those markets. Um, 6.2 million tons of that comes from ilmenite, so it's the majority of, uh, of, of, of titanium dioxide supply um, globally. And only half a million tons actually comes from rutile. Now, if rutile is 95% of the way there to what, what, what the end product needs to be, then why is only half a million tons of it used? And the, the, the simple answer is there's just isn't enough of it around. In fact, most rutile in the world is a byproduct, a lower grade byproduct of ilmenite mines. On this slide, you can see just what that means in terms of uh, supply of rutile uh, and expected global rutile supply out to 2030. The commodity has been in, uh, in structural deficit since 2017 and continues to uh, uh, increase that deficit over time. Uh, where we think by or TZMI, which is a uh, which is a uh, well-renowned uh, titanium minerals um, consultancy, they believe by 2030 that we'd be around 250,000 tons of uh, of rutile versus the 750,000 tons we were in 2017. Currently, as I said, we're about half a million half a million tons. So, so that's a 70% expected decrease in global rutile supply. Um, at the same time, the demand side for TiO2 is expected to increase by 2.8 million tons. Uh, you can see some of the other players, uh, Luca Resources, which owns uh, the old uh, Sierra Rutile um, projects in Sierra Leone. Sierra Rutile, as some of you may remember, was listed on AIM uh, and was taken out by Luca in 2016. And you have Base Resources, another ASX and AIM listed company, which has the, the, the Quale project. Between those two, they probably produce around 30% of global rutile supply, uh, the rest coming as a, as a byproduct of, uh, of ilmenite mines. Um, the key here is that uh, it's been over half a century since a new significant <coughs> standalone rutile dominant deposit has been discovered. Until we discovered Cassia, 
Um, <clears throat> so, so we discovered Cassia, uh, as I said in the intro, uh, a bit serendipitously while we were looking for graphite. Uh, towards the end of uh, last year, we were able to put a mineral resource estimate out, which showed uh, about 605 million tonnes of material uh, trade uh, with, um, with about 1% rutile grade and 1.24% uh, graphite grade, which gives us about 6 million tonnes of graphite and 7.5 million, uh, sorry, 6 million tonnes of rutile and 7.5 million tonnes of graphite within that, that resource itself. That resource made us the largest undeveloped rutile deposit in the world. Uh, we're one of the largest standalone rutile dominant deposits discovered in over 50 years. You can see on that chart there in the green, we stand um, we, we, we stand side by side with Sierra Rutile um, as, as one of the top two rutile resources in the world. And, and look, we, we expect a substantial additional resource growth expected um, why can we say that? Well, that, that resource that you see on Casilla um, only covered 38% of the known uh, total drill-defined mineralization footpr footprint in Malawi at the time. Since then, a few weeks ago, we announced some drill results. What those drill results did was they have um, changed that 129 square kilometre uh, rutile mineralization uh, zone into 165 square kilometer rutile mineralization zone. So that's increased uh, uh, in, in, in footprint. So actually the resource that you saw is just below 30% of the total defined mineralization at this moment, um, which, is, which is why at the bottom of this slide, you can see that uh, bullet point, that significant potential resource increases are planned for early to mid-2022. When we defined that resource, we um, announced an initial scoping study, and this really was to define or, or give a signal to the economic parameters around that resource. Uh, so we know it's big, um, and to better understand the, the, the financial or economic benefits of the rutile and the graphite byproduct, we completed a scoping study which said, okay, if we were to mine this resource for 25 years uh, in a plant with an annual throughput of 12 million tonnes, what would that look like? And what it looks like is we'd be producing just over 120,000 tonnes of rutile, about 80,000 tonnes of graphite, um, and that would all culminate in an NPV, a post tax of around 860 million US dollars and an IRR after tax of 36% uh, with a payback of two and a half years on a capital cost of $332 million. So, so what we're saying there is um, our NPV over CapEx is around 2.6%, making the uh, making the project uh, viable at this stage uh, at a scoping study level. Uh, over those 25 years, you'd uh, get a total revenue of over $6 billion. Um, that's around $250 million of revenue uh, uh, averaged over, over each year and $160 million of EBITDA, so quite a high EBITDA margin there. Um, in terms of contribution to the economy of Malawi, we'd be creating over 480 direct jobs and many more indirect jobs uh, in, 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 a, in a space and in a commodity that is uh, highly strategic and experiencing extreme supply deficit. So why are we getting such good numbers from our scoping study? The, the, the answer lies within the next few slides. So simple geology. As I, as I said uh, at the beginning, um, the rutile mineralization sits just below surface. So if you imagine that you're looking at this drone picture on the right hand side of this, uh, this slide, um, if you were to take the top half a meter away, you'd be looking at the, the mineralized, uh, the, the, the mineralized uh, material right there. The highest grade rutile uh, sits within the top five meters. So we know that now uh, after after extensive drilling um, and that allows us to really um, uh, really focus on those high grade areas and really start picking up 
high grade rutile early on in our in our um, scoping study uh, mine plan. How would we be mining this? Well, on, on this slide, you see one of my colleagues holding holding this uh, uh, the, the material that hosts the rutile, and it's a homogeneous, soft, friable saprolite. In layman's terms, it's it's soft rock. You can crush it in your hands, uh, as you can see there. It doesn't need huge drilling and blasting with explosives or a, a anything of that kind because it occurs like that and because of certain chemical parameters of that saprolite we're able to hydro mine this uh the, this uh, deposit what is hydro mining it's essentially that picture there where you see uh, a high powered water jet being aimed at the sur material surface and uh, and and that water uh, essentially mixes with the material creates a slurry that slurry gets pumped uh, directly to the uh, the plant. Okay, which takes us on to processing. It, it's a very conventional flow sheet. This is all off off, off the rack um, type of plant machinery. There's nothing here that is uh, that 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 is new tech or anything like that. Um, so after we hydro mine, that slurry gets fed into the wet concentration plant which then goes into a mineral separation plant where we, where we uh, are able to retrieve the root our product. For an incremental, a marginal incremental cost, and, and I would say around 10% of total capex, we are able to um, construct a graphite flotation plant next to the mineral separation plant, which would, uh, which would give us our graphite product. On the right-hand side here, you can see um, some of the, the parameters that we're getting from, uh, from some uh, metall uh, metallurgical test work we did, including two bulk test work programs we've done over the past few years, um, and, and along with the uh, scoping study. So we were getting up to 100% of the rutile recovered. Uh, we're getting a premium specification rutile uh, at 95 to 97.2% TIO2 and quite a high grade coarse flake uh, graphite as well. Um, why is that premium spec of rutile important? Well, premium, uh, premium specification rutile ends up in the uh, welding industry and the welding industry pays around a 25% premium on average to uh, your, your, your contractual rutile prices. Um, why is that of interest to us? Well, a few weeks ago, we announced our first MOU with a potential off taker, and that was with the US group Haskell International, who are a global um, welding products and rutile uh, uh, distributor processor. And that MOU has been signed for 25,000 tons of, um, of our rutile product. Uh, simple progressive rehabilitation. Well, what does this mean? This means that, uh, look, Casilla is a huge deposit. Uh, the plan is to start at one end and get to the other. Um, and what we don't want to do is, um, is not be able to return this land to communities on an ongoing basis. So we've modeled in simple progressive rehabilitation, which is essentially all tailings. Uh, so once we've taken the graphite and the rutile out of the out of the material. That material is disposed back into the pits where it came from. Those pits are rehabilitated in real time, and the area is returned to farming or bushland or or, or whatever um, community driven um, uh, uses that land had. What that means is, unlike many other mining projects around the world, we're not um, we're not using up land. Uh, or community land for, for, for several years or decades. We're actually looking at several months here. Again, this is not new. Uh, this is not new tech. This is not something groundbreaking. You can see an example of progressive rehabilitation of a mineral sands mine there. Uh, there at the bottom of that, uh, that page. And I think that's about 36 months between the, the first and the second picture there. So all in a low risk operation, um, simple mining, uh, which I've talked about using hydro mining, uh, simple processing using a simple conventional flow sheet, and, uh, and, and that allows us for progressive rehabilitation, positioning us for effective ESG outcomes. 
Uh, a little bit about Malawi because uh, I'm aware it's not uh, it's not that well known um, to people. It is a member country of the Commonwealth. It's a former British colony. Um, so English is the spoken uh, commercial and legal language. Um, the, the the legal uh, framework is based on uh, uh, British common law. Um, and look, it's attracting significant investment. It is a, uh, a poor nation, so they understand that um, industries such as uh, mining uh, can bring uh, can bring real development to uh, to the to to Malawi, both at a national and a local level. So there's demonstrable aspiration for mining. Um, there are a few other. Uh, companies such as Lotus Resources, Globe, and uh, Macango, who are uh, who are also exploring and operating in uh, in Malawi. Um, had we had this conversation, or we had discovered Cassia about fifteen years ago, it would have been a bit of a moot point, despite its size. And and the reason is Malawi is a landlocked country. However, ten years ago, the Nakala Logistics Corridor, which is that red um, rail line you see there on the on, on the map uh, that got uh, that got built by Vale, the large um, the, the the large uh, miner, um, alongside a number of development banks. Um, and what that uh, logistics corridor does is it connects Malawi to the Nakala deep water port, um, and so that allows us uh, operational ready infrastructure. Uh, on a logistics basis. So we've already done the work to understand how much a ton of our product um, from our, our mine gate to the Nakala Deepwater port onto a vessel, um, what the cost of that would be. And, uh, and at the scoping study stage, that was just over $50 a ton for a retail product that's selling for around $1,400 a ton. Uh, here's, here's, here are a few um, examples of the operational ready infrastructure. So you have uh, bitumen roads there. Um, you, you, you can actually see in that, that picture, there's a sign for Casilla. So that's only five clicks away from Casilla. Um, the logistics corridor uh, railway, you can see operating there and, uh, and, a, and a helicopter shot of the uh, deep water port that has uh, all, the, all the infrastructure required for uh, for onboarding on vessels. Um, a lot is said about ESG and environmental benefits or otherwise of mining companies these days. Uh, we are in a fortuitous position in that natural rutile because it's a, um, a high grade product of the end use of rutile it's a direct use material at 95%. It can be used directly in the production of pigments, um, which then go into paints and coatings, etc. Um, on the other hand, ilmenite needs to be upgraded via quite energy and carbon intensive processes, uh, which create um, which create essentially synthetic alternatives to rutile, such as titanium slag which uh, is around 85% TiO2 and synthetic rutile, which is around 88% TiO2. Um, what we did last year was we tried to understand uh, the, the, the fundamental uh, objective nature of that, that carbon saving of natural rutile. Uh, and what you can see here is essentially we had an independent consultancy based here in the UK, which said, if you were to take a ton of natural rutile in the pigment production process versus a ton of um, any of its alternatives, you would be saving 2.8 tons of carbon emissions per ton of that natural rutile. But what does that mean in, uh, in the layperson terms? Well, an average car, uh, on the roads of London um, would would emit around one and a half tons per year. Um, so you're talking about once you're talking about scaling this up to hundreds of thousands of tons of uh, of production over many years, you can see the uh, significant the significant environmental benefits of of natural rutile. 
So look, just, just in closing, exciting year ahead. The first bullet point here, uh, revised life cycle assessment. We put that out a few weeks ago. Uh, what that re revised life cycle assessment was, was essentially, okay, we know from the slide previously that we'd save about three tons of, uh, of carbon dioxide by using natural rutile. Well, if we mined the rutile at Casia the way we have outlined in our scoping study, what does that mean vis-a-vis uh, -vis the alternatives? And what we found was that um, that, that producing a ton of natural rutile at Casia is about 20 to 33 times lower carbon footprint than its its alternatives. So that's quite a significant one. And I do urge you to go and have a read of that, that RNS. Um, second point here, substantial jork resource tonnage increase. <clears throat> that's expected uh, in H1 uh, 2022. Uh, some of you may be aware that we went into a trading halt on the ASX um, overnight uh, pending a mineral resource estimate update. Um, given the nuances of a dual listing, we are still trading on AIM. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk more about that at this stage. Um, and look, that uh, any JORC, uh, JORC resource will then feed into an updated scoping study, um, which we're hoping to complete around mid-year this year. Once that's completed, that'll, that, that, that then will take us on to um, commencement of the pre-feasibility study. Um, and obviously we will still be talking to and discussing potential execution of MOUs with future RUTAL off-takers. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand back over. That's perfect, Safan. Thank you very much for your presentation today. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the top right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company do take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we've received a number of questions today. Um, and thank you to all investors for submitting their questions. If possible, please could I ask you to read out the question and give a response where it is appropriate to do so, and I'll pick up from you at the end. Sure. So uh, on the questions, first question here, the headline numbers look very good. How do you see the project funded and how long to revenue? Um, so look, we're at scoping study stage. We uh, and we had an initial scoping study out in December last year. We're expecting a an updated scoping study based on a new resource um, mid-year this year. Uh, we would probably use the rest of this year to get to a pre-feasibility study stage by the end of uh, end of this year, which would mean that next year is really focused on getting a definitive feasibility study done um, with a construction or a decision to mine uh, closer to the end of next year. So in terms of first cash flows, we're really looking at 26, 2026, uh, 2026 um, assuming that it will take us uh, two or so years to, to, to build the project. Um, okay, next question here. What can you say about the strategy and the capital cost to production? Well, look, our, our strategy really is to better understand exactly what we have on our hands. Um, as we drill more yeah, from our previous drilling announcement, you can see that the the, the mineralized area is increasing. Um, it's still open laterally and at depth, so we're still we're still understanding what we have here. What the initial scoping study has done for us is it's basically told us um, even if we were to mine thirty percent of this project um, and on a capex number that is for lack of a better word, bite size for a company of our size, or is, is, is financeable by a company of our size, um, that that would give us $0.9 billion of MPV. So, so, so really for us, it's a matter of understanding more about, well, how much, uh, how much more of this material do we have? What grades it at? Um, how big can this thing get? And hypothetically, if someone was to throw larger numbers of capex at it uh, what would that mean in terms of the uh, the economic viability of the or, or, of the project um a couple of questions here on uh funding 
look, it's very early stage for us to uh, to be talking about funding. Um, my my background is I was an investment banker to uh, to the mining sector for about fifteen years. Over that time, I've probably funded twenty or so different projects, uh, or helped fund twenty or so different projects. Um, so it's not uh, it's not something new for us. But what I would say is. It's, it's early stage. We need to better understand what we have here before going into what the funding looks like. What I will say is that uh, a project of this size um, and given the scarcity of the commodity is more likely than not to attract um, attract a number of off-takers uh, uh, globally. And those off-takers, in order to secure supply of this material, are unknown in other commodities and within within the mineral sand space to um, uh, to take up uh, financial positions or financing the construction of these projects uh, in the past, and it's something that will will obviously bear in mind along with the plethora of other other financing uh, solutions we may have. Um, and I think that's that's all the questions answered yeah. from the side. That's perfect. I think you've addressed all those questions you can from investors today. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today and we will publish those responses on the InvestMeet company platform. But just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, could I please ask for a few closing comments? Uh, yeah, sure. Look, so uh, so I think the way to look at sovereign metals is um, it's, it's the... It, it's the right commodity. It's a commodity in um, supply deficit. It's a commodity that the demand side is only set to grow. Um, there's more than enough space in the market for uh, for the type of levels of production we're talking about coming from Casia. Um, if we're looking at half a million tons of this product or this commodity uh, being lost over the next uh, next uh, eight or so years. And we're only furnishing around 120,000 tons into it. Um, it's still going to be in structural deficit. Uh, so that's one point. The second point is the the environmental benefits and the environmental impact on carbon footprint of using lower um, lower carbon footprint uh, TiO2, uh, which which essentially is what rutile is because it's been beneficiated by Mother Nature rather than in 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 a in a smelter somewhere, um, they shouldn't be overlooked. They're uh, very, very um, important, both uh, both financially to users, uh, but also to consumers of end products. And, uh, and and as we move towards a more sustainable um, sustainable future, and and look, thirdly, I would say we are um, putting out quite a bit of news flow. Uh, we have been over the last few months. In fact, you'll probably find that we've been putting out quite material uh, announcements uh, once a week or so over the last uh, few months. And, and we continue to keep our, uh, our uh, the investor community and our shareholders abreast of everything that we're doing. Um, so I'm hoping um, that we will have more 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 announcements over the coming, uh, coming uh, weeks and months. Sapan, thank you for updating investors today. Club please ask investors not to close this session as you now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Sovereign Metals Limited, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all.